Silverhawks was Rankabass's second action adventure series. People have asked me over the years, how much were Arthur and Jules involved in the development of these stories? And my answer is a thousand percent. But again, their talent was getting what I consider a beautiful triangle of myself, Masaki Izuka, and then Peter Lawrence. The one thing about Rankin Bass is they really like character. Jules Bass came up with a partly metal, partly real thing. He's the leader, Jonathan Quick. His hawk code name, Quicksilver. We started developing this concept called Metaloids. So we thought, okay, if we're gonna do something metal and throw him in outer space, we still had to have that 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 human story part that we could bring out. I've been fighting the mob up here for 300 years, Sergeant. This isn't the first time they pulled the old magnetic attraction stunt. It's cops and robbers in space, but cops and robbers work. One day we'll be able to send an ordinary person 100 light years into space, General. Little by little, the designs we had kept going back and forth between human side, and that's how they became partly metal, partly real. Shoulder jets. Operative. Arm jets. Affirmative. So we showed all of the stations, the one hour special of Thundercats, so they could see what we were up to and uh, validate the whole adventure and then said, by the way, here's this thing called Silverhawks. There's something so illogical about Silverhawks. And being a cartoon, <sighs> you could kind of bend all the rules. You could make characters pretty wild, you know, pretty bizarre. We got our go for 65 half hours of Silverhawks before the first Thundercats aired. So that was a very crazy year of continuing with the Thundercats, then launching Silverhawks. <laughs> I think that Lee and all those folks were incredibly busy juggling the two shows at the same time. You know, when we were in the booth doing the recording sessions for Silverhawks, we didn't feel it because really, you know, we had these hours scheduled every week and, and, and that's just what we did. I think certainly the writers, the director, the producers, all those people were having some sleepless nights because they had a lot of stuff that they had to get done. We kept things small and it was something that was just a genius of Arthur Rankin and Jules Bass is that not only their creative genius, but the way they could structure a production that allowed for a world of flexibility. They already had fantastic camaraderie and just incredible kind of back and forth that went on during the recording sessions. <laughs> Remember, sir, it's a game of chance. And your chances are zero if I don't win tomorrow. You'll see a lot of the same actors on Silverhawks. Bob McFadden, Earl Hamm, and Larry Kenny we discovered on Thundercats, and Peter Newman. With those four guys, it wasn't just a matter of keeping things small and, oh, we know how they worked. They were just too good to lose. We then discovered this darling Maggie Jacobson, and she was just thoroughly a delight. And that was good, bringing in a new actor who could spark everybody else. <laughs> we tuned them out. I had a great time playing Melodia because she was so out there. Really, she was probably the first of the great annoying characters that I went on to play. <laughs> she, she unleashed the annoying in me. It must be that Silverhawk. I can't stand that hillbilly stuff. It's so much fun to play the villainess, and I've, I've gone on to play the villainess and other things. It's very liberating. Faster hardware! I've got him in my side! I think to have a musical villainess is a nice idea. It's like a kind of screechy punk rock star who's a villainess or villain. Silverhawk's a very different, obviously, concept. The partly metal, partly real, off in the galaxy. But we still wanted to do something extra, so we created these little epilogues where they'd be science lessons. Today, we're gonna learn something very important about the planets. We had our darling little copper kid was the one who were taking these quizzes with bluegrass at the end of each episode. Great score, kid. And scoring points if he got it right. You got it right for six points. What we wanted to do was come up with a contest that the kids could take the quiz along with Copper Kid and then write in, call in their station, give their answers, and come up with prizes or rewards along the way. And logistically, it was just too hard to put together. Can you imagine doing it now? Hey kids, go to the website, take the test. It would just have been so much easier. Sky Shadow, the Silverhawks' most dangerous opponent yet. Today's episode of Silverhawks. Toyetic is an uh, inside term for a fantasy from a show that we think really translates well to toy play. I want my own bird, a bird as evil and mean as I am. Silverhawks was very toyetic, 
because of the fantasy of flight and the ability to then transform that into winged characters that you could play out them flying around. My smoke jet failed. I'll have to duck below the casino. The combination of robotic and human also work great for that because you could do uh, very toyetic looking characters that were really distinctive on shelf. There was so much interest from a variety of toy companies that obviously the big guys, they knew that this should happen up front. But a lot of the characters that we came up were kind of toy friendly anyway. There was a very strong group called Action for Children's Television and powerful lobby group, and they were getting a lot of press, accusing American television was just turning into wall-to-wall -wall commercials. The whole battle between toy companies and all the shows, extended commercials for toys and so on and so forth, was really heating up. So being a little leery of Kinner coming to the table, all of our concerns were dissipated, I would say, within the first few weeks of working with them. It was a big time for the boys' action industry. Transformers, G.I. Joe, Masters of the Universe was a real strong period for that part of the industry. Great guy by the name of Tom McGrath became our direct liaison. We were able to explain to him what was important to us, what we needed to make that series work. The whole fantasy was partly metal, partly real. So we caught him, first of all, with the very neat vacuum metalized look, very shiny figures. Kids would see that on the shelf and it would stand out on the shelf and be like, wow, that's those are cool. Look at the metal on those. Quicksilver, the lead hero, his wings, you could put his arms down, he'd squeeze the legs and his wings would pop open. And kids would sit there over and over again. It was pretty exciting to have my little character flapping her wings in the in the toy store. Click, wings up, put it down. Click, wings up, put it down. The, the sound that they made when you press the button, they went you know, they made that great sound. Never got tired of it. We had our brilliant tally hawk, right, that would be sold alongside Quicksilver. And he was very integral to the show. But then Kenner said, hey, you guys, you know, can we have a bird with each of the main characters? But we thought about it. And you know, when you really sit down, it's like, oh my god, the screen is just going to be these birds. We probably gave them more ideas than they wanted. But there was a very good exchange. The, the people at Rankin Bass were pretty open to our ideas. We tried to add some ideas that we thought would be both good for entertainment and for toys, some of which they used, some of which they didn't. But uh, we worked pretty well together. My pitch to him was, listen, if I can't make it work in a story, the show's not going to go anywhere, and you're not going to get any exposure. And that's the end of it. The entertainment's the key. If people don't watch the show, you're never gonna get around to selling the toys. So the show had to be entertaining and fun to start with. Okay, Bluegrass, head for daylight. With pleasure. They might get a design from Kenner, something, you know, rough draft sketch. And instead of like, oh no, I've gotta figure this out, it would be like, I'm gonna show those Kenner guys what I can do with this. There was kind of a one-upsmanship at times where we'd have an idea and they'd say, okay, let us think about it. And then they'd come back with something that was targeting what we were after, but a little bit better, and we go back and forth, which is wonderful. That's what you want, working together to try to make the best possible finished product. And my staff just loved it. Toys were all over the office as they were prototyped and, and brought out in production. The relationship worked. You want to pay us a visit, hey, Silver Hawk? It's absolutely good guys and bad guys. That's all it is. But as usual, the bad guys are always much more interesting than the good guys. I'm gonna end this little wing ding on the right note. Yeah, I'd like to think that you could do it again. I really would. Certainly as feature film material or a two-hour home video animated release. Get your circuits in gear, Lieutenant. I think it'd be a lot of fun to do a new Silverhawks line. Monstars got Quicksilver. Prepare to launch. I think the vacuum metalized look is something that's very unique and very cool. I would play that up even more than we did back then. I would think that Silverhawks would have a life today. The good versus evil aspect of superhero cartoons are pretty consistent, so I would think Silverhawks could fly again. Yep, Earth's a mighty pretty sight from up here, isn't it? Let's be 